Grace and peace of our Lord and Savior be with you this morning. Happy Monday to everybody as we pick up and continue our um, study through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this morning we'll be covering uh, chapter 13 uh, of the Gospel of Luke. Um, the setting today is a little bit different uh, simply because um, in the room where I normally uh, broadcast these things, that's been turned into a classroom as the kids start their uh, online uh, school day. So Gray's in there now. I think he's working on uh, PE or something. He's watching the video about doing push-ups and that kind of thing. So in any event, um, good morning. Uh, in any event, uh, that's why I'm here in the, in the kitchen um, to talk about uh, talk about chapter 13. Again, and I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again, is that if you've missed any of the videos so far, they're here on my Facebook page. They're on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, our worship service from yesterday is also on there. Um, Take the opportunity to go uh, look at those and forward them on to your friends, your family, whoever it, it, it may be. Uh, but I hope it's been a benefit and a blessing uh, to everybody as we go through uh, the Gospel of Luke. We're on the, uh, the back half of it now, starting today. We'll do 13 this morning. We'll do chapter 14 later on this evening. Um, and we'll just keep on going until we get to, uh, get to Saturday. Uh, and then we'll finish up uh, sometime that night with the Gospel of Luke. And then look toward maybe doing something else uh, the week after that, depending on their situation on the ground, so to speak. Uh, as we move forward. But uh, before we get started, I want to invite everybody to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. O oh God, who in love and pity sent us Jesus Christ to be the light in our darkness, give me wisdom to profit from the words he spoke and grace to follow in his footsteps. Jesus said, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespass. O oh God, give me the grace to do this now. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. O oh God, give me grace today not to think of what I can get, but of what I can give. Jesus said, when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. O oh God, grant that what I give may be given without self-satisfaction, and without thought of praise or reward. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. O oh God, give me grace today to keep to the narrow path of duty and honest dealing. Jesus said, do not judge. O oh God, give me grace today to take the plank out of my own eye before I look at the speck in my brother's or sister's eye. Jesus said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world? yet lose their own soul. Oh God, give me grace to live this day in such a way that whatever else I lose, I will not lose my soul, my very life in you. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. And this Lord is now how we all pray, saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, so we're going to get into uh, chapter 13 uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to see a theme emerge that we have gone away from. We're going to come right back to it now, uh, that theme being one of repentance. And so again, I'm going to read chapter 13, and I encourage you that uh, even if you have your Bible out and open or your Bible app on your phone out and open, uh, it's just listen to me read these words and, and maybe, um, I don't know, adopt a posture of prayer. Close your eyes, bow your head, uh, but just sit and meditate on the words as I speak them. Let them wash over you and, and, and fill your heart and mind. And again, if you got any questions, concerns, comments, anything at all, just leave me a message in the on the Facebook page there. Even as we're going through them, you know, the purpose here is for us to be as interactive as we can be, uh, given our, our days of, of quarantine or isolation or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but let me know what you're thinking, um, what you're hearing, uh, and these kind of things. So in any event, uh, let's get started here. Luke chapter 13. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
he asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. I want to pause here just real quick and make reference to the fact that Jesus mentions the Tower of Siloam. Siloam, does anybody remember where you may have heard that word the last couple of days? Well, in our gospel lesson yesterday during worship, it was the story of Jesus giving the blind man sight. And if you will remember, the disciples had this question about, well, who sinned, this guy or this guy's parents? Because certainly somebody must have for God to uh, punish him with being blind. And then Jesus says that neither. You know, this man is blind maybe so that we can show the, the effectiveness, the power, the mercy, the grace of God through our works through him. And then Jesus bends down and he makes some mud and he puts it on the guy's eyes and he tells him to go wash. Well, where does he tell him to go wash? He tells him to go wash at the pool of Siloam, right? So you got a tower of Siloam here and they're talking about repentance and sin. And then you got the pool of Siloam where uh, Jesus had the man wash his, uh, his eyes yesterday. Also a story about repentance and sin. So you start to see this theme now starting to come back. We talked about repentance and sin a little earlier in the gospel message. Now Jesus is, is bringing it uh, back a little bit. But do remember, like we talked about yesterday, if we use as uh, our uh, a bookend, so to speak, sin and punishment for the story of the Christian life, we we're getting it wrong. The story of the Christian life doesn't begin in sin and end in punishment. It begins in creation and ends in restoration, right? And everything that takes place in between creation and restoration, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's the work of Jesus in our heart, minds, and souls. That's the work of God showing his glory through all we say, act, and do. Verse 6, then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. I want to pause here just to make reference to the fact that, again, this theme of repentance is coming back to us. You know, in my study Bible, it says that the themes that Luke uses throughout his, uh, his telling of the Jesus story, uh, you know, they kind of go all over the place, you know, truthfully. But again, repentance, which was an important theme early on, is making an appearance here again. And the force of the teaching is summarized in the twice-repeated conclusion that unless you repent, you will all perish, right? Unless you repent, then you will all perish. The parable here emphasizing both God's patience with the unrepentant and the limits of that patience, right? So God is patient with us and allows us time to repent. But friends, there's going to come a day when God is done. And the second coming comes, and if you haven't repented and believed and given your life over to Christ at that point, well, let us just say that there are going to be some issues. Verse 10, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, <clears throat> and, what, and to what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, To what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. 
Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. When once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then in reply he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. I think this just further underscores the fact that, yes, God is patient and kind with us as he waits for us to repent and, 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 and come into the family, so to speak. But there's going to come a day when you know, the master of the house shuts the door. And you, if you have not repented and believed at that point in time, if you're not already in the house, well. Verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Huh? On the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Let me stop there to say he's probably, he, not probably, he's referring to himself, because he knows what lays ahead of him, Right? He has got to go on to Jerusalem, and he's not going to taste uh, defeat, or I shouldn't say defeat. He's not going to be handed over and betrayed and put to death and rise again until he gets to Jerusalem. Verse 34, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to point, stop here to point out that you know, the Pharisees, as, as we've been reading on the story, as it goes along, we see that the Pharisees becoming exceedingly hostile to Jesus. But here, they're warning Jesus of Herod's plot against him. But Jesus is not worried because he knows what the future holds. He knows what his end result is going to be. He knows what he has to do, must do, uh, to save, uh, save our world. He knew that he will eventually die and be resurrected, but only in Jerusalem. That's the end of chapter 13. I want to go back real quick and read something that's in my uh, study Bible in talking about the parable of the fig tree. It says that there are many who testified to a before and after in their lives. God's grace chased them until their lives blossomed with peace, justice, hope, caring, and humility. In Jesus' story of the fig tree, and again, this was verses 6 through, uh, six through 9, the gardener offers to put fertilizer around the barren tree. Growth comes because the gardener works at it. John Wesley believed that God finds ways to nurture and mature us into the fullness of love. These means of grace... Scripture, prayer, worship, fasting, Lord's Supper, holy conferencing, acts of mercy, become ways by which God nourishes us towards fruitful living, full love of God and full love of neighbor. So again, God has given us everything that we need to be fruitful in our missions and our ministries to our fellow man. But like the gardener here is talking, we have to, we have to work at it. We can't just be lazy and lay around and not work at it. And those things that God has given us, scripture, prayer, worship, fasting, the Lord's Supper, holy conferencing, which means meeting you know, in worship, acts of mercy. So that's chapter 13. I want to move on now to our uh, devotional we've been using as we've gone along all these chapters. And, and these, are, uh, these are two good ones. These are, these are two that we're going to talk about this morning that aren't for the faint of heart, so to speak. It references back to the first five chapters. It says, Our Lord strongly lays down the universal necessity of repentance. The truth here asserted is one of the foundations of Christianity. All of us are born in sin. We are fond of sin and are naturally unfit for friendship with God. Two things are absolutely necessary to the salvation of every one of us. We must repent and we must believe the gospel. 
Without repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ, no man or woman can be saved. Again, repent and believe. Repent and believe. We've talked about this a number of times in worship. We've talked about it a number of times uh, in confirmation with the youth. Um, repent and believe. That's, I, maybe it might have that on my headstone when I pass away. Repent and believe because that is the only path for our salvation. The nature of true repentance is clearly and mistaken, unmistakably laid down in Scripture. It begins with the knowledge of sin. It goes on to work sorrow for, for sin. It leads to confession of sin before God. It shows itself before man by a thorough breaking off from sin. It results in producing a habit of deep hatred for all sin. Above all, it inseparably connected with lively faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance like this is the characteristic of all true Christians. The necessity of repentance to salvation will be evident to all who search the scriptures and consider the nature of the subject. Without it, there is no forgiveness of sins. There never was a pardoned man who was not also a penitent man. There never was one washed in the blood of Christ who did not feel, mourn, confess, and hate his own sins. We cannot be happy if we reach the kingdom of glory with a heart-loving sin. The company of saints and angels would give us no pleasure. Our minds would not be in tune for an eternity of holiness. So the question then for us is, have we ourselves ever repented? Do we really know our own sinfulness? Do our sins cause us any sorrow? Have we cried to God about our sins and sought forgiveness at the throne of grace? Have we ceased to do evil and broken off all of our bad habits? Do we cordially and heartily hate everything that is evil? If we have never yet repented, let us begin today without delay. For this we are accountable. There is everything to encourage us to begin. If we have repented in times past, let us go on repenting to the end of our lives. Repentance, unfortunately, I think, is oftentimes reduced just to a simple, I'm sorry, without a change in behavior uh, or a change in direction of your lives. In fact, repentance, true repentance, is a radical break from sin. It means a complete 180 degree turn from a sinful life or sinful decisions, sinful thoughts, moving back towards the arms of your heavenly father. So saying I'm sorry is not good enough. You come to God and you say, I repent of my sins and I seek to be made better. You know, we've talked before about how in this, this period of the, of the church season called Lent um, is all about getting in contact with our Heavenly Father and trying to have those areas be exposed in us that need to be strengthened and also need to be straightened. You know, I've used that phraseology any number of times, you know, since, uh, <laughs> since February 26th, which was Ash, Ash Wednesday. But, uh, but I do encourage everybody to, you know, repent of your sins because there is a promise that once you repent of your sins and try to live a Christ-like life, your sins are going to be forgiven, right? That's, that's in Scripture. We bring our, our confessions to the Lord, and then we are pardoned by our Creator. One more thing to read to you here, and this deals with uh, chapters, I'm sorry, verses 6 through 9. This is, again, the fig leaf, and I found this to be particularly interesting this morning. It says, this parable is particularly humbling and heart-searching. The Christian who can hear it and not feel sorrow and shame as he looks at the state of Christendom must be in a very unhealthy state of soul. We are taught that where God gives special privileges, he expects proportionate returns. Our Lord teaches this lesson by comparing the Jewish church of his day to a fig tree planted in a vineyard. This was exactly the position of Israel in the world. They were separated from other nations by the Mosaic laws and ordinances, no less than by the situation of their land. They were favored with revelations from God which were granted to no other people. Things were done for them which were never done for Egypt, Nineveh, Babylon, Greece, or Rome. It was only just and right that they should bear fruit to God's praise. It might reasonably be expected that there would be more faith, penitence, holiness, and godliness in Israel than among the heathen. This is what God looked for. But we must look beyond the Jewish church if we mean to get the full benefit of the parable before us. We must look to the Christian churches. They have light, truth, doctrines, and precepts of what the heathen never hear. How great is their responsibility. It is not just and right for God to expect fruit from them. We must look to our own hearts. We live in a land of Bibles, liberty, and gospel preaching. How vast are our benefits compared with others? Let us never forget that God expects some fruit. 
Few things are so much forgotten by men as the close connection between privilege and responsibility. We are all ready enough to bask in our privileges and pity those not so blessed. But we are slow to remember that we are accountable to God for all that we enjoy. Let us awake to the sense of these things. As a highly blessed people and nation, God looks to us to see our fruit. Think about that just for a second. Think about the position that we are in, in a country where we have um, no restrictions, truthfully, on worship. You know, we can open our Bibles whenever we're out and about and read them and not face persecution. We can pray in public and not face persecution. We can go to church you know, when they're open uh, without having to worry about persecution. But from all of these benefits, all these privileges, God does expect us to um, you know, show fruits of those benefits, which means that we have a responsibility to go out and, and be evangelists and be ministers and be missionaries. And when I say those three things, I don't mean that you necessarily have to go to seminary or you have to go to some third world country, right? You have to stand at, at, the, at the corner and be a, you know, a, an outdoor preacher. What I'm saying is each and every one of us, as we've talked before, has been given special giftings, right, from the Lord, uh, special talents by the Lord. And so what we need to do is to find out where the Lord wants us to use those giftings and talents to be ministers, missionaries, and evangelists in our corner of our communities. Because, again, every one of us has an ability to show forth the love of Christ in all that we say, all that we, how we act, and what we do. Um, and part of that is our responsibility as, as Christians. We've been given so much from our Lord that should we give a little bit of that back, right? We've talked before in this Bible study about how if we open ourselves up to the influence of the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and minds to the point of overflowing, well, that overflow is what carries us out to be in service to our communities. And so let us not be the, the fig tree that's given all of this, uh, this nourishment, all, you know, all of this that, that's needed to grow and not bear any fruit, right? Let us all be uh, fig trees that bear much fruit because we have been nourished and have been given the word of God to help sustain us and encourage us and strengthen us. So we have a duty and an obligation to go out in this world uh, to try to shine the light of Christ to those who don't know him yet or who have did do know him but have decided to uh, maybe turn away from them or they misunderstand him. You know, that's our calling and that is our, that is our duty. All right. Well, friends, that is chapter 13 of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we'll gather back together later on this evening around 7 o'clock or so and we'll go over chapter 14. Again, if you came in late on this one, that's fine. The video will be saved here in just a second onto the, my, my Facebook page. So you can go back and watch it. I'll load it up to my YouTube channel uh, here in just a little bit so you can watch it there as well. Uh, again, if you got questions, concerns, comments, uh, send them my way. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, but as we depart this morning, I want to invite you to join me as we go back to the Lord in prayer together. O Lord and maker of all things, whose creative power made the first ray of light and who looked on the world's first morning and saw that it was good, I praise you for this light that now streams through my windows to waken me to the life of another day. I praise you for the life that stirs within me. I praise you for the bright and beautiful world around me. I praise you for the earth and sea and sky, for the hurrying clouds and singing birds. I praise you for the work that you have given me to do, for all you have given me to fill my hours of leisure. I praise you for my friends. I praise you for music and books and good company and all harmless and delightful pleasures. O oh Lord, you yourself are everlasting mercy. Give me a tender heart today towards all those who are in this morning light less joyful than I am. Those in whom the pulse of life grows weak, those who are unable to get out of bed to enjoy the day, the blind who are shut off from the light of day, the overworked who have no joy of leisure, the unemployed who have no joy of labor, the bereaved whose hearts and homes are desolate, have mercy on them all. O oh, light that never fades as the light of day now streams through these windows and floods this room, so let me open to you the windows of my heart that all my life may be filled with the radiance of your presence. Do not let any corner of my being be left in darkness, but illuminate every part of me by the light of your face. Do not leave anything within me that could darken the brightness of this day. Let the Spirit of Jesus, whose life was the light of all people, 
rule within my heart until evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, hope you enjoy your Monday. We'll gather again later on this evening to tackle Luke chapter 14. Again, if you've missed any of the chapters, that's fine. You can catch up today. I don't know about your part of the world, but here it's just going to rain about all day, so it's a good day to stay in and, and uh, you know, binge on something. Why not binge on the Gospel of Luke today? But all the videos are there on the Facebook. They're also going to be on uh, my YouTube page. Enjoy your Monday. We'll see you later on this evening for chapter 14. God bless.